webinar is being recorded. Please stand by. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first Lunch and Learn webinar of 2021, Improving Winter Airfield Operations with Centralized De-Icing Facilities. Today's program has been generously sponsored by Kim Lee Horn, Gresham Smith, and JCII in partnership with the Chicago Department of Aviation and Memphis International Airport. To kick off today's webinar, here's Tony Esposito with Kim Lee Horn. Thank you very much, Micah, and welcome everybody to today's Lunch and Learn. My name is Tony Esposito, and I'm going to get us started with the presentation. First, before I do so, I'm going to give out some introductions on today's presentation. We have Nate Lennon, also with Kim Lee Horn, presenting, as well as Tim Arndt with Gresham Smith to talk about glycol collection, and Mike King to talk about SmartCAD technology. Once uh, these individuals finish presenting, we're going to hear from folks in the airport and airline side. We have Frank Grimaldi, who is the Assistant uh, Commissioner with the Chicago Department of Aviation, Matt McLean, who is the Project Manager with the Chicago Department of Aviation, Keith Wisniewski, a Manager of Operations at CBA, Gene Herrick with de-icing at American Airlines, Chris Pearson, who does de-icing for United Airlines, and we have James Hay, who is the Director of Development from Memphis International Airport, and Brian Tenkoff, who is the Manager of Engineering and Construction at Memphis International Airport. Our agenda today is we're going to start off giving an overview of the IC facilities before jumping into site planning processes. And then we're going to take a look at glycol, both the storage and distribution, and then the spent de-icing fluid management that is associated at a de-icing facility. Before finishing the technical part of our presentation with PAM Management and Technology with JCAII. We will then, at that point, listen to case studies for the DIC facility at Chicago O'Hare that is currently in use and will be in use this afternoon, as well as the Memphis facility that is currently under construction. At the end, we will go through a brief Q&A. We have received over 200 questions from registrants, which we are very appreciative of. So we will be consolidating that down to a small four or five questions we will answer today. We do plan to take a look at all those questions to be answered at a later date and to be distributed by ACC. So the overview, first of all, what is an aircraft de-icing facility? Simply put, it's a facility where the de-icing or the removal of frost, ice, and slush or snow, as well as anti-icing, icing, the protection against the accumulation of those materials is removed from an aircraft. It's important to note that even though some of these design facilities we're going to talk about today are at large hub airports, they may be scaled down to meet the needs of an airport at a smaller or medium-sized hub as well. So where does de-icing occur? Uh, the most common place you get de-iced nowadays for, is at the terminal gate, as many people on this call probably experienced that in the past. But as the centralized de-icing facilities are starting to become more popular here in the United States, we're seeing a lot more airports and airlines prefer the centralized de-icing facility off-site away from the terminal gates. So why consider a centralized de-icing facility? First of all, it increases safety, especially for those that are operating ground service equipment at the terminal areas. If you can imagine all the different types of equipment that are driving around, anything from lavatories and catering trucks to baggage and aircraft tugs, all driving in the same area, Add in all the de-icing trucks and the amount of equipment that can be in conflict with each other, as well as the glycol that can become slippery on the pavement itself, you're creating a potentially unsafe condition at the terminal gate. So by moving to the centralized de-icing facility, you take a lot of those conflict points out of the de-icing operation. Secondly, it captures high concentrations of glycol in consolidated location. Uh, because of the amount of glycol that gets, that gets sprayed and gets um, drips onto the pavement, there are areas that are specifically designed at centralized de-icing facilities to collect that glycol. And there is potential, once it's collected, to even recycle the glycol for other uses, which we'll talk about later in the program. And then also, uh, it improves terminal gate utilization. During a de-icing operation at the terminal gate, as you can imagine, uh, the aircraft, in many cases, are still occupying the gate. And if there's an inbound aircraft that is supposed to take on that gate, that aircraft has to get held up somewhere else on the airfield, and it causes delay not just to that flight, but the flight following that as well. And then finally, why use why to consider a centralized de-icing facility, why not uh, take a look at the taxi dip times for departure points? As we're going to talk about more in the program, 
Centralized DIC facilities are located closer to the departure and the runways. It reduces the taxi time to the departure point then, and it helps with holdover times, which in, um, in simply put is the expiration time, the glycol will no longer provide its use for an aircraft, and at which point an aircraft will have to go back to get the ice once again. Some of the standards and references that are used in the design of aircraft de-icing facilities are listed on this slide here, but most importantly, from the FAA advisory circulars, you'd be looking at uh, FAAC 150-5300-14, Design of Aircraft De-icing Facilities, which was just revised in the last couple of years, as well as the supplemental document, SAE ARP 4902, Design of Aircraft De-icing Facilities. For those on this webinar that are calling in from international locations, there are also ICAO Annex 14 Volume 1 and ICAO Aerodrome Design Manual Part 2 that describes some of the guidance for the design and planning of a centralized adjacent facility. So we're going to go into the site planning process. Um, and this process has multiple assets to it. Um, First, you're looking at a site. We're going, to, we're going to take a look at the different sites that may be selected and where that is most favorable for a de-icing uh, operation in an airport. We're also going to talk about the sizing of the CDF and how many bays would be ideally constructed and compare that against uh, the typical uh, delays uh, based on those sizes of the bays. Uh, and then finally, we'll look at taxi routing and queuing. Now, one thing that's important in this is you can see that the arrows are pointing from left to right. This is an iterative process. So just because we picked the site first doesn't mean that that's the end location. We may determine based on the sizing. We may need to go back and look at a different site um, in the final design layout. So there is an iterative process that is important to keep in mind as we go through the site planning process. So the first part, site selection. Um, as we mentioned a minute ago, um, the primary point of the site selection is to locate the de-ice facility as near to the departure end of the runway as possible. Uh, that is, of course, because of uh, the interest in reducing the taxi time after the last drip of glycol reaches the aircraft until the aircraft actually departs and the wheels go up. So you're trying to decrease that taxi time. So you want the taxi route to be minimal and the de-ice pad to be as close to the departure end of the runway as possible. You're looking also to benefit as many users uh, around the airfield as possible. Uh, most people think the icing is limited to, um, to the terminal gates and the commercial service users, but in some instances, uh, there are large hubs for cargo airlines, as well as some pretty significant SBOs. And as we get down to the GAs, the GAs can be from any part of the airfield. So you want to be taking a look at all the different users that may be using your de facility and make sure it's beneficial to as many users as possible. Then finally, you want to also identify impacts that may, that may be causing um, issues with the development or redevelopment of the existing land. These, these items could be anything from wetland mitigation to grant assurances that may need to be paid back to the FAA based on some of the facilities that may need to be removed for the building and construction of the CDF. So all those items go, get thrown into the site selection process, and then we can take a look then at the sizing of the CDF. Um, and this really is um, the, the practice here is we're looking at the number of de-icing bay pads. Um, and there are several things you need to consider with that. First is the aircraft type and traffic. What size aircraft are going to be using the de-icing facility? How many aircraft are going to be taken to the de-icing uh, pad during the winter storm. Um, and with that, what is the bay occupancy time? And there are several factors that go into the bay occupancy time. And this is really just the time the aircraft is actually de-icing within the de-ice bay. You're thinking of the storm type, the aircraft size, the number of de-icing trucks per aircraft. And ultimately, if you're looking to, um, to maximize your efficiency of your de-icing operation, you're also considering smart pad technology. Uh, going back to the storm type, uh, you know, this, many people think that a heavy snowstorm is always going to be your most critical de-icing event, but as some airports realize right near the um, areas around Atlanta and Dallas, a strong de-icing um, rain event, a freezing rain event, 
uh, can cause just as much havoc to the icing operation and increase that bay occupancy time. Well, then once you have selected a number of pads that would be the perfect um, opportunity for your de-icing bay, uh, you also want to think about the, what is reasonable delay, because you could build eight bays and have zero delay to your system, or you could economize it down to maybe six bays, for instance, and your delay might be up to half an hour. So the laws of economics and what is considered a reasonable delay to the airport users needs to be, there's a, there's a tug and pull there a little bit as you're going through that process and ultimately at the end, you're picking an option that's going to be satisfying both the economics and the reasonable delay at your facility. So some of the aspects with, um, that are considered for a CDFD icing size um, is a geometric layout. The vehicle maneuvering area is the area that is an unmarked 12 and a half foot wide width around the silhouette of the aircraft. And this is an exclusive area to each aircraft that is during the de-icing operation. So if you have another aircraft that is de-icing either left or right of this aircraft in this image, it will have to have its own vehicle maneuvering area exclusive to its de-icing operation. Another component to the CDF uh, sizing is the vehicle safety zone. And these zones are parallel to the aircraft during their taxi in and taxi out of the de-icing pad. These are marked and are at a minimum 10 foot wide and they're marked as you can see on the right hand side coming from the FAA advisory circular. 10 foot is the minimum, but keep in mind they, these can be much wider, uh, up to 40 or 50 feet to accommodate such things as glycol refueling stations that may have tanks that are actually sitting right on the apron so that de-icing trucks don't have to go back to a separate area driving through the snowstorm. They can just de-ice right there on the pad or refill right there on the pad and return for the next de-icing event, the next de-icing aircraft. Um, high mass lighting, when you get to some of these larger de-ice pads that we're going to talk about in a few minutes, you're going to need high mass lighting, so this is the perfect place to locate that as it was in the vehicle safety zone. And then finally, as we talk about smart path technology, this would be the location where we put electronic message boards. So all these items getting added into the vehicle safety zone can increase your size from 10 foot wide up to 40 or 50 feet. So once you've identified your vehicle maneuvering area and your vehicle safety zones, you can lay out the pad for your de-icing. In, in this instance, you're seeing a composite pad that was laid out where we looked at both a narrow body and wide body um, mixed use. This is similar to in the terminal planning world of the Mars gates, where we can either use two narrow bodies or one wide body for each bay. This optimizes the flexibility, especially at your larger hub airports. And this, was, this exercise in particular was taking a look at what a group six to two group threes or a group five to two group twos or two group threes, what those different uh, options would look like before settling on a final um, uh, an optimized layout for the overall de-icing facility. Other considerations when sizing a CDF, you don't just have the, the base itself and the concrete that is associated with that, but you also need to consider where will you store and collect glycol on your, on your de-icing pad? Is it going to be off-site or is it going to be a part of this de-icing bay itself? Um, in some instances, uh, airports want to have a ramp tower so they can visually see the aircraft going in and out of the de-ice pad. It also functions to serve for communications between not just the ramp tower um, personnel but, and the pilot, but also to the de-icing trucks themselves, so they can be communicating with everybody that's involved in the de-icing operation to make sure that everything is running smoothly during the de-icing event. And then finally, what, what do you do with the GSE when they're not de-icing and on the de-ice pad and the de-ice pad wants to be used for other reasons? Um, looking at putting them in a staged area and a pad off-site off -site can also improve um, the overall use of the de-ice pad during non-winter events. So once we have the site located and the size identified, we need to take a look at the taxi routing and queuing. And if part of that is looking at the origin locations for all the users that are going to be using the de-icing. Is it coming from mostly from the passenger terminals? Is it coming from a cargo hub? Or is it coming from others such as the FBO? Then once you have those locations identified, you set up a queuing route of what the taxi route would look like for the individual aircraft. 
And then as we're looking at exiting the de-icing facility, we need to think about the holdover time versus the taxi time. Some holdover time for some glycol manufacturers is only a few minutes, where some other glycol products will give you over half an hour. So you need to be thinking about the holdover time, and as that weighs against the taxi time to get out of the de-ice path to the departure end of the runway. It's also really important at this point to be coordinating with the air traffic control tower and operations at the airport to identify impacts to current taxi routes, as we'll get into that in just a moment here. So this is a layout plan for a de-icing facility that has been completed in the past. The blue arrows indicate the taxi routes to the de-icing pad. Once the de-icing is completed, the aircraft follows the green route to the departure ends of the runway, as you can see. We try to minimize that route as much as possible to get to the two departure ends of the runway in this instance. Also on this exhibit are orange arrows, and this is for bypass considerations. Some airports, even though they do invest in a centralized de facility, will use a hybrid model and de some aircraft at the terminal gate. And so once those aircraft leave the terminal area, they're already on their holdover time. They've got an expiration time that they need to get off the runway and into the air. So you want a clear route from the terminal gates along that bypass taxi route to get those aircraft to the departure end of the runway as quickly as possible. So you're trying to get them away from the queue to get into the de-ice pad. So in this instance, we're taking a look at multiple routes for aircraft from different facilities on the airport itself. Other considerations when planning a centralized de facility is to think about the airfield clearance criteria. Um, obviously, there's objects that are associated with the de icing facility, both on the ramp and off the ramp. So you need to be taking a look at the taxiway object-free areas and taxi lane object-free areas, as well as any wingtip clearances that are associated with the, the taxi routes around the de icing pad. In considering that these DI pads are typically located near the departure ends of runways and navigational equipment may be on during the winter storm, you need to be thinking about signal interference and degradation. So coordinating with FAA tech ops during the planning stages of the DI facility to make sure that you're eliminating signal interference and degradation and not preventing aircraft from arriving during the winter uh, event is also a critical part of this process. And then finally, air traffic control tower line of sight. Your, your DI facility may be adding new taxiways to the airfield, so you need to be paying attention that the air traffic control tower can still see those new taxiways that are associated with the DI pad. Now, sometimes the DI pad is on the movement area side of the airfield, and sometimes it's on the non-movement side of the airfield. So knowing whether or not that de-icing is occurring on the movement or non-movement also plays a role to make sure that the air traffic control tower can see the aircraft, especially during movements on the movement side of the airfield. <laughs> Along with uh, new taxiways, there may be new roads that are associated with the construction of a de-icing facility for GSE and other vehicle equipment that needs to access the de-icing facility. So you want to revisit your airport safety plan, especially for winter operations, and make sure that the priority that is given for plowing certain parts of the airfield include these taxiways as part of their priority one during a de-icing event so that those areas are not in an unkept, unsafe environment when it comes to the de-icing event itself. And then finally, as we mentioned before, um, nighttime lighting is going to be critical. Uh, some of these de-icing facilities, as you can see in the picture on the right, are pretty massive in size. We're talking um, 10, 12 bays in some instances. And lighting is going to play a critical role, especially during low visibility and nighttime operations. So you want to take a look at where to site high mass lighting, and not just where it could be located, as we mentioned before, in the vehicle safety zone, but also paying attention to your Park 77 and missed approach services for your runways, as those runways are typically going to be very near to the de-icing facility itself. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nate Lennon. He's going to talk about glycol storage and distribution systems. Uh, thanks, Tony. Uh, like Tony stated in this section, we're going to talk about glycol storage and distribution systems. There are a variety of potential layouts, configurations, and system options available, and uh, we're going to try and touch on a handful here. Um, something to keep in mind, the design and implementation of any one of these storage and supply solutions is certainly going to be dependent on specific site variables, inputs, and facility goals. Uh, so firstly, uh, there are typically 
two fluids utilized for aircraft de-icing operations, type 1 and type 4, type 1 being a diluted or blended, uh, blended with water um, uh, de-ice fluid. Uh, it's for the removal of ice, snow, frost, contamination from aircraft control surfaces. Um, it can be purchased raw or blended, um, pre-blended, uh, and is typically applied hot and under pressure. Type 4 is a preventative glycol, uh, anti-ice fluid. It's always applied raw, un undiluted, has a high viscosity, and can provide for higher holdover times. Um, the FAA does provide some general guidance, uh, as um, Tony may have mentioned previously, uh, under Advisory Circular 150-5300-14, design of aircraft de-icing facilities, there are links for these FAA holdover time guidelines uh, for winter ops 2020 through 2021. Um, these are uh, guidelines. Um, certain providers, vendors, and suppliers will have proprietary um, criteria. Um, one thing lastly, uh, glycol is a non-Newtonian fluid with shear characteristics. That is, it can be mechanically sheared, uh, resulting in a degrading uh, fluid performance. And so it has to be handled properly. Um, a lot of these fluids also have shelf lives. So um, those kinds of considerations need to be taken into account when developing your glycol storage facilities. Um, there are a multitude of storage system types, each with its own associated requirements. Uh, these storage systems can be as simple as plastic tanks or totes. Uh, two more permanent systems, such as horizontal or vertical tanks. Um, the type of storage system implemented will need to be balanced with expected volume requirements, fluid turnover rates, um, operations, both current and future, um, costs, and many more. And we'll get into those. Um, but we're going to quickly define some of the general storage configurations, uh, layouts. Uh, so centralized tank farms versus decentralized tanks. Um, centralized tank farms. Uh, as the name implies, the central location for a great many number of tanks, uh, large volume management, uh, large fluid storage. Um, this configuration may lend itself to better inventory management. Um, decentralized tank storage, uh, that's the storage of various tanks or, or uh, totes uh, across the airfield, or maybe smaller uh, decentralized tank farms. Um, this may lend itself more to individual airline or consortium operations, uh, fluid management. Um, and then finally, location of these farms or tanks, uh, land side versus air side. There are pluses and minuses to each. Um, land side located for, uh, tank locations uh, would most likely lend itself to better supply, uh, i.e., you don't have to escort your supply or delivery in through uh, secure gate offload and then escort them out. Um, airside located uh, farms would also lend themselves more to uh, refilling operations for your DI trucks. So let's dive into some of the variables that may impact the decision making process for storage. Um, storage capacity and volume demand. These seem similar. Um, however, volume demand is more uh, the demand of fluid that the de-icing operations are going to require for any de-icing event. Uh, storage capacity is that fluid that you store to meet that volume demand. Um, and there are two, typically two, uh, fluid types, type 1, type 2. So taking into account the volume demand for each type, uh, the storage capacity required for each volume demand, um, and then the associated space requirements. So count on tanks, the size of tanks. Uh, if you have a pressure supply network, um, which we'll get into in a bit here with the, with the supply system. Um, if you have a pressure supply network, uh, you'd have to make sure that you take into account space requirements for um, uh, an associated pump house. Uh, and then finally, spill containment. Uh, what kind of spill containment are you going to need for the types of storage solutions that you're contemplating? Um, so there is a quick schematic here of a, a rough scenario. Um, so here you'll see uh, type 4 tanks raw, type 1 tanks raw, and then uh, a handful of 5 tanks for uh, blended, right? And there you can see a water line running to an offload station and blending station um, with a schematic pressure pipe network routing out to potential 
um, fill stations out on site, maybe strategically located or co-located with the ice packs. Uh, so, rolling, oh, sorry. Rolling from storage uh, solutions into glycol supply systems. Um, one of the key components for a supply system is fill stations. Uh, whether that's uh, centralized or decentralized, that is, is, is there a single point access for filling operations for your de-ice trucks, or are there a variety? of or a handful of supply uh, fill stations. Um, are these fill stations located land side or air side? Uh, and then the associated pressure pipe network with it. Now again, glycol is a shearable fluid. Um, so taking into account the distance runs from your storage facility through a pump house to your fill station locations, um, routing and distance is going to be important to take into account. Um, here you see a possible scenario with a centralized tank farm uh, to decentralized fill stations co-located with um, de-ice positions, uh, blenders on site for blending on demand, type 1 and type uh, and supply for type 4. Um, and there is an offload tank uh, located at the uh, tank farm. Uh, this is for offloading the glycol from uh, the ice trucks for whatever reason, whether that's maintenance or other. Uh, we have another scenario where we have decentralized tank farms with um, shorter supply runs to VSE located fill stations. Just another concept, uh, reducing the run on pressure supply networks. So that brings us to the pump house. Um, again, there would be need, there would be a need to consider space requirements and uh, infrastructure. Um, here you're seeing a uh, pump house facility in operation, constructed and working, and then uh, a proposed uh, schematic view, so uh, isometric view of another pump house in contemplation. You can see. Uh, Pipe runs are color-coded for type 1 raw and blended, blue for water, um, green for type 4. Um, fairly robust mechanical systems uh, designed specifically for the distribution of glycol to various fill stations. Um, finally, with your storage and supply um, systems, uh, there is going to be a balance between uh, the introduction of operational efficiencies to maximize aircraft throughput, um, balanced with upfront construction and development costs, design costs, um, and ongoing maintenance costs. So, of course, the more complex the system, um, there may be a need for additional maintenance. Uh, how you're going to operate the system may play a role and factor into the development of your storage and supply systems, whether that's airport managed, a third-party service provider, some sort of airline consortium or tenant managed system or combination thereof or other. Um, so um, with that, um, as we work through uh, storing glycol, supplying glycol to the deicing facilities, supplying it, uh, we move into what happens after. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my associate, Tim Arndt, and uh, He's going to talk to you about spent de-icing fluid management. Okay. Um, thank you, Nate. Um, hello, everyone. Um, again, I'm Tim Arndt from Gresham Smith, and we'll be transitioning now from the uh, part where uh, the de-icing fluid is needed to help support safe operations to now we have this stuff on the ground and uh, we need to do something with it. So let's start by just asking the question, what is spent de-icing fluid? There are a number of names that people use to describe this, but basically it's de-icing fluid, whether it's type 1 or type 4, that hits the ground on the pads, outside of the pads, and usually mixes with water, whether that be snow melt, rainfall, 
um, or melting snow that's been, been piled for some time. Most of the focus when you're speaking of a centralized de-icing facility is on the spent de-icer that is on the pad itself and then will get collected, but it is very important to understand that the fluid can get carried to areas outside of the pad. It can be blown by the wind. It can be tracked out by uh, ground service uh, vehicles and it can certainly be carried by the aircraft where it may drip onto taxiways or shear off on the runway. And for airports that have permit conditions that may um, have limitations for outfalls draining areas outside of the de-icing pad, sometimes collection of that storm water that's contaminated with those fluids outside the pad is necessary in addition to collecting and processing what's on the pad. So why do we need to do anything with the de-icing fluids in the first place? Well, there are a number of environmental impacts associated with them. Um, by far, the, the impact that causes most airports to have to put in some kind of spent de-icer management is the impact of the de-icing fluids on dissolved oxygen in the streams that may be receiving stormwater runoff. So both, both propylene glycol and ethylene glycol, um, when they get into the stream, they basically act like sugar for any bacteria that may be living in, living in the stream. As those bacteria consume the glycols, they also consume dissolved oxygen. If the dissolved oxygen drops below uh, certain levels, which for most states, the standards are in the four to five milligram per liter range, it can then um, impact the aquatic life in the stream. And so virtually every state has standards for the minimum dissolved oxygen concentration in streams. A another, um, another environmental impact is the potential formation of biofilms. So bio biofilms are basically combinations of bacteria um, with some polymeric material that may be um, um, essentially coming from the bacteria themselves and forms this kind of web of goo, if you will, that may form on um, surfaces at the outfalls within the streams. And sometimes this is referred to as nuisance growth in the streams. There are specific um, prohibitions for the presence of solids and growth like this in streams, and some airports have found that if their problem is significant enough that those biofilms lead to additional requirements for managing spent de-icer. The propylene glycol and ethylene glycol, while they're not generally considered as toxic materials like any chemical, there's a point at which if the concentration becomes high enough, it can be toxic to aquatic life. And so some states do have standards for the maximum concentrations. And then you also can have odors and foaming, um, which in the right situations or the wrong situations can result in the need to have additional spent de or management. So most of the time, um, any collected stormwater containing de -icer, if it's going to be discharged on site, would be regulated through one of two permit mechanisms. Anything going to a surface water would be regulated under an NPDES permit, whether that be an individual permit or a general permit like a multi-sector permit. Um, some airports um, will send portions of the stormwater with the icer to the sanitary sewer, and usually they're required to have industrial user permits, which also may have limitations. From a background standpoint, it's important to know for an NPDES permit in particular, there are a lot of different regulatory mechanisms that can lead to um, the agencies putting limitations in your permit, including numeric uh, criteria, water quality criteria, narrative criteria that basically prohibits things like odors and solids, and then moving on down to uh, things like total maximum daily load allocations, which would be specific to a stream. And certainly permit writers have the ability to make an, um, their own judgment on it. So the reason this I'm bringing this up now is as you develop and renew your NPDES permits, be aware that there may be a variety of 
of elements that are leading to those limits. So if you're in a situation where you've got limits in a permit, especially if you've got strict limits, then you'll be looking at some sort of spent deicer management. And in the simplest form, spent deicer management is really just a series of various interlinked components um, used to manage the spent deicer that's mixed in with the storm water you know, for the purposes of reducing the environmental impact and allowing permit limits to be met. There are potentially a lot of tools, a lot of, of, of different pieces and parts or unit processes that can be utilized when you're managing spent deicer. Um, you can broadly group them into, in, in, into two categories. One is um, elements associated with managing the flow, really from the point of application um, to the point of processing, and then the processing and disposal element itself. And really the question is which combination of, of these is is right for your situation, right for you to meet your permit conditions, to manage your operations, and, and to minimize your costs for spent deicer management. As you're going through the process of either planning a new system for managing spent deicer or planning revisions to those systems, which can often happen, especially if the airport is undergoing increases in flights or there's a big development, there's, series of steps to follow, starting with needing to characterize the spent deicer and moving through determining the types, sizes, sequences, and locations for those components before you are able to characterize performance of different alternatives and, and finally come up with costs. And in the next few slides, we'll, we'll touch on some of these individual elements and things to think about. So let's start with characterizing the spent deicer. So what we're really talking about is there's a certain amount of deicer and stormwater that you're starting with. You have some kind of constraint on the back end for how much you can discharge. In the simplest terms, what you collect minus what you're allowed to discharge is equal to the amount that you need to process. And so there's an exercise that um, every airport will need to go through in order to do that characterization. Um, and that can be done through various combinations of monitoring data. Maybe it's data that you already have. Maybe it's data you have to go out and sample and analyze um, some sort of calculation. And then there's a number of models that are available that um, really represent kind of the full um, deicer management process and are able to, to look at how all these different um, elements are linked together and what the impacts may be. So let's talk about a few items associated with flow management. So flow management, as it's defined here, encompasses a number of different items. So everything from the initial collection from your pads or from you know, outside of your pads to the means of conveying the water, whether that's through gravity or, or a force main. And then also measures for monitoring flows and concentrations and then potentially segregating, segregating the, the flows. So from a technology standpoint, if you're collecting on, uh, on the pads, really that's when you're looking to get your most concentrated flows for processing. If you need to collect outside of the pads with some sort of um, collection and conveyance system, those are going to be more dilute flows. And this concept of monitoring and diversion, it's sometimes a really underused element of deicer, spent deicer planning. Um, it can actually significantly reduce the amount of storage and, and treatment and reduce your overall capital costs. And the basic, basic idea is to do some kind of monitoring, often with an online analyzer like this TOC analyzer that you see in the picture, where on some short-term basis, every 10 minutes or so, you're getting a concentration. Those values are then tied into some sort of um, valving or gate system within your collection, um, within your collection scheme that then allows you to, say, dilute the most dilute flows that maybe meet the permit limits directly to a stream and only collect exactly what you need to collect for additional processing. So one of the key elements of processing is the broad category of treatment. So in its simplest form, treatment is really a means of either separating the glycols from the stormwater or degrading and breaking down 
those chemicals. Both have the same endpoint, and that's reducing the amount of glycols and, and other breakdown products that are in the stormwater that you're discharging. And the two most common categories are recycling of processing and, and, uh, of the deacer for recycling and reuse of the deacer or biological treatment where you're actually breaking down the glycols into components, ultimately ending up with water and carbon dioxide that are not going to have an impact on your stream. When you think about different treatment technologies, often like to think about it in terms of those that are applicable to more concentrated flows and those that might be more applicable to dilute flows. So for concentrated flows that might come directly from a de-icing pad, there, there's three that are often used and, and most often, although not always, associated with recycling of the, of, the, of the glycol, and that's reverse osmosis, which is a membrane filtration type of a system, mechanical vapor recompression, which is based on evaporating some of the water and leaving behind a more concentrated um, glycol, and then distillation, which is really the measure that's used to concentrate the glycol up to maybe as much as 99% um, where it's um, then brought to a place where you can put additives back in or, or for reuse on, on the market or used in, in some other industry. Um, there are circumstances where using those technologies for recycling are maybe not possible. Maybe, there's, maybe it's a cost decision. Maybe there's a situation um, where the market's not looking great for recycled fluid, or maybe there's simply no um, outside uh, um, entity nearby that can, say, do the final processing of it. In, in those cases, you can look to a more biological treatment to treat those concentrated flows. There are a number of airports that use an anaerobic fluidized bed reactor, which is what you see in the picture to the right for treatment of high concentration glycol um, and reduction of concentration to levels that can be discharged. If you're getting into more dilute flows, there are a number of other biological treatment technologies, including aerated gravel beds and activated sludge systems that, that can work. Um, a couple of things to think about when you're, when you're evaluating what to use for treatment. For most airports in most situations, there's more than one treatment technology that, that, that can work. And it really comes down to sort of what's the right fit for your facility in, in terms of your layout and your costs and, 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 your, and your sequencing. And then treating de-icer is, is challenging. It, it's, it's challenging because the, the water is cold. It's challenging because there's a lot of variability in the flow rates and a lot of variability in the concentrations. And so there's often some form of management of the flows that's needed before going into treatment and I, I couple that with this bullet about watching out for too good to be, be true solutions because sometimes you'll see things advertised about being able to get great results. And those oftentimes aren't really good applications. They may not be able to treat as much as you want given the conditions or they um, may simply not be able to process enough flow. The other important element of the processing side of things is really storage. Usually storage and treatment are coupled together. Um, storage uh, can be used to contain storm surges, so uh, big flows coming off of, a, say you have a de-icing event that happens to be followed by a rain event, which is a, a fairly frequent and challenging occurrence. And then it can also attenuate the peak flows and concentrations going into your, your processing system or going into a sanitary sewer discharge. There's a number of different ways to store the water, um, everywhere from lined ponds or lagoons, um, which sometimes may need to be covered for managing uh, hazardous wildlife attractants and odors. Um, also, above ground storage tanks are fairly common. In some places, underground storage tanks are also used if there's really space constraint issues, but they, they definitely tend to be more expensive, and so it's a bit of a, a last resort for, for most folks. Um, main thing I want to get across about planning for, for storage is it can take up space, especially if you're going with a more of a, a lagoon concept. And so it, it's important as you're doing your long-term planning to, to kind of acknowledge that these things may take up space and identify areas where you could put that storage. 
the last piece of the spent de-icer management is disposing of it. Um, it can go to surface water, it can go to a sanitary, and in some cases it can get hauled off the non-airport facilities for further processing. When, when you're thinking about where you're going to discharge in, in any given airport, there may be more than one location where you can discharge. It's really important to think about the permit compliance risk. Um, not many airports can afford either space-wise or, or money-wise to put in systems that are going to contain every last drop of stormwater that may, with the ice that may ever fall. And, and so there's always a decision on what is the risk um, under extreme conditions for, say, going to a stream. Um, it's also important to decide on the, the um, disposal locations early because th those locations are really the ones that are going to set the limitations on how much you can discharge. And it's difficult to evaluate what you need to do in terms of treatment and storage and collection and all that if you don't understand where you're going to be sending the water. Talk a little bit about uh, site selection. As I indicated earlier, oftentimes when airport master plans are done or even utility master plans or stormwater master plans, the space that's needed for spent de acer management can get overlooked and sometimes it's just a scramble when it's, there's a realization that there is a need for significant spent de acer management of where to find it. And, and if you don't have um, locations mapped out and, and set aside for that, you may be faced with sort of breaking up your, your systems, storage and treatment, for example, into pieces. And if you do that, you're getting into a lot more conveyance and, and a lot more costs. A really key part of the uh, spent de management planning process is determining what kind of sizes that you need for the various components. Usually the sizes for conveyance are pretty much straight up hydraulic calculations based on the amount of flow, the, the peak flow rates that you have to process. But when you get into storage and treatment, those are the key things for the, uh, when you're evaluating size. They definitely have a relationship to each other. Bigger treatment usually means smaller storage and, and vice versa. The things you're going to be looking at when sizing Sizing these are what are your permit limits, what's your drainage area, whether it's just on the centralized de-icing facility area or outside of that, your flight schedule, um, aircraft types, and certainly your local weather conditions. And storage size, as I was describing with the disposal aspect before, is definitely a compliance risk-based decision, and it needs to be understood by everyone involved exactly what those risks may be. Generally, what we see is going with a somewhat lower treatment capacity and higher storage capacity tends to be the best combination in, in terms of, of cost especially, but it also helps to kind of smooth out operations in treatment because it gives you a little bit better way to deal with the variability that you may see in the flows and, and um, the icer coming, coming down the pipe. So bringing all of this home on spent de -icer, just keep in mind that you may need to do spent de -icer management for what's coming from the centralized de -icing facility and potentially off of it. Um, what you need to do in terms of the component sizes, locations, costs are highly site-specific. It's always tempting to look at the, the neighboring airport and see what they paid and what they used for their systems, but these systems are very much custom um, as driven by your own permit and de -icing and infrastructure situation, and which ties really into the last point, that it's really important to understand what are the, the sort of driving features for what you need to do for um, spent de management and what you need to do for, or what you have in place for constraints. So with that, I will pass it over to Mike. Thank you, Tim. talk about path management and technology. Thank you, Tim. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Hume. I'm with uh, JCAII. And today we want to talk about how technology works hand in hand with CDF to help improve de icing efficiency and operations and coordination. So, uh, JCAI, we're a Canadian based company uh, specializing in aircraft ground de icing technology. 
Uh, two platforms that we have are Iceling, which is the de-icing management system, and SmartPad, which is the visual coordination system that applies to the CDF and how the coordination process works. Uh, it's a turnkey solution for airports and airlines and service providers alike. Um, the first one I want to talk about is Icelink. It's a unique um, operational web-based system that helps to uh, collect and process data in real time. It's adaptable to every fleet type of de-icing truck. Uh, it eliminates the requirement for any handwritten paperwork. Uh, it is easy to use and it reduces verbal communication and requirement to uh, wait until frequency uh, frees up before communications can process. So this also provides all of the uh, relevant stakeholders with the real-time information so decisions can be made in real time and based on situation that is at hand. Uh, this includes the flight ops, the airport operations, airline operations, as well as the de-icing service provider. Uh, all of these people are getting information in real time and are able to react accordingly. By doing so, it allows us, now the system allows you to process data, to collect it and process and allow you to optimize your operation. So if you're witnessing any deficiencies because you're getting information in real time, certain adaptations can be made to optimize the operation and ensure uh, efficiency throughout the path. By providing uh, an, a geospatial view, which gives you a rendition of the airport and where the icing occurs, at a glance, operators and all stakeholders can see how the operation is running and what type of efficiency we're, we're getting with the um, with the system and with the de-icing. And in doing so, it allows you to identify next available resources. Whether the icing occur at the gate or at a CDF in the bay, it'll allow an operator to see which is going to be the next uh, bay that will be freed up and uh, allow assignments to be made accordingly. Uh, the other element that we talk about are the truck situational awareness. Um, as was mentioned earlier with glycol replenish and stuff like that, the system allows you to see what level of fluids are in each of the trucks so that decisions can be made on uh, replenishing times and how many trucks you can send, uh, which trucks are you going to be sending first. So, uh, And also one ele key element in here is also ensuring that the glycol concentration that is being applied on the aircraft is adequate for the outside temperature. So the operator or the user dispatcher can see this and see who's in the truck, how much fluid of each quantity or what the quantities are of each truck and what level uh, of concentration is being applied to the aircraft. Uh, another element of the system is it can be integrated directly into TIDS or any airport airline system. So when we pull the information to create a flight strip, there's very minimal typing. All the information is directly uh, input into what we call the flight strip, uh, allowing the operator to create a, a request with the proper flight number, departure time, departure gate, uh, aircraft type, and uh, then allowing him to create that request. We can also feed back the information pertinent to de-icing to systems such as CDM, which are being used to... Uh, between airports for collaborative decision making, which allows airports to know when um, each flight will be ready to depart and how long it takes to de ice. Uh, another element is the de icing management system is the uh, dashboard, which allows you to see uh, your operation three hours you know, over a three hour period to determine are you going into a snow event or are you coming out of the snow event? By looking at these numbers, you can see what your efficiencies are. And because the system can be used either on a CDS or a gate operation, it's broken down so you see uh, how many flights you've done of different category types, uh, how long it's taking you to de-ice, what is the throughput time. So based on that, decisions are made by the airlines and, and by airports on uh, throughput traffic, uh, which can be uh, accommodated during an event. Real-time performance uh, monitor, again, uh, by selecting the date range, you can see 
what is your uh, performance as far as uh, average de-icing time, average lineup time, which is the time an aircraft is scheduled to depart until you've actually finished de-icing it. shows you how much fluid. So when you're looking at environmental impact, uh, how much fluid is being applied, how much are you recovering. The information is readily available. Uh, it'll show you how many flights are being done. Um, so with this information, because we've got KPIs that allows you to monitor and uh, analyze in information to look at improvements through the process. Another element is the global view, and this is both mostly for uh, airline operators uh, through an OCC operating command center which can see uh, an entire system which airports are being uh, are going through a de-icing event as we color code it um, as Nathan mentioned earlier uh, type 1 is orange in color so if you see uh, an icon in orange you know that airport is de-icing could be just frost or if it's green it means you're in a snow event requiring anti-icing uh, fluid being applied so I can actually now uh, zoom in on whatever airport, they'll give you the information on number of flights, how long it's taking. So with that in mind, decisions are made, uh, critical decisions are made uh, if you've got crew legality issues or aircraft rotations, that information allows you to make a decision based on real-time information. Uh, next element we want to talk about is the, the pilot application. Uh, which is important uh, because of the pilots coming from different places. Not all pilots have the same level of experience with the ice, with winter operations, and it makes things a little bit difficult in certain airports where if op if pilots are coming in and are based in a warm climate, um, they're not familiar. So with the uh, creation of the pilot app, it allows the pilot to put in a request and ensure that there's no miscommunication on the request. It will allow him to see also what is the treatment that is being proposed by the service provider on the ground and ensure that he's happy with it and or he can make changes. So with that, uh, the pilot also is involved throughout the process. So he'll be notified when the icing will start. He will see the icing throughout the entire process, uh, wings being the ice, uh, aircraft being anti-ice, and then uh, provide him with the information how much fluid and, and uh, hold over time. He's also got other tools that are available for him, uh, such as weather forecast. So when he's making decisions, he's got a lot more tools available uh, to ensure that the decisions that are being made are correct. Now we want to talk about the uh, components of SmartPad. SmartPad, as I indicated, is a coordination system that works hand in hand with a CDF. Um, this there are uh, some key components, such as the bay management system, which I just talked about here. There's the uh, de-icing management system, electronic message boards, thermal guidance system, and inset ground lights. All of these integrate into a one system uh, or can operate independently. They're not required, and this can be scalable, as Tony mentioned earlier, to any size of airport uh, and or facility. So the SmartPad technology... Uh, like I said, integrates everything into a one system. It provides all of the stakeholders with situational awareness in real time, and is designed to improve, uh, you know, improve and standardize the icing operations. No matter if you are in a Chicago where they de ice almost every day, or you might be in a Dallas where they de ice once uh, once in a while, it allows everybody to keep that proficiency because it's a, as a workflow process. So. The objective with this, again, I uh, won't go through all of them, but it's to increase the, the safety. Uh, it's to provide necessary tools to reduce the throughput times, increase traffic, and make the CDF very efficient uh, by reducing the icing times and idle times. The main management system, uh, as I, I showed you earlier, this one here will show you the operational situation on the de-icing pad, which aircrafts are in which bay, at what status of the de-icing process they are at. So it will help you to make determination on the next incoming aircraft and see how efficient your operation is running. So at a glance, uh, because it's color-coded, each color code defines a particular status of the de-icing process and allows the operators to make decisions and uh, the stakeholders to see what is happening with the de-icing. Electronic message boards, 
which uh, comply with the FAA, uh, the circular and the SAE, are provided to uh, are there to provide visuals for the pilots. Uh, the main purpose that was used initially was to ensure pilots were uh, holding their position while the icing occurred to prevent any miscommunication and incident which we uh, in the industry are aware have happened in the past a long time ago where aircraft were moving. So this ensures that the pilot has a visual to, to stop and stay in position while the icing is done safely. As you can see here, um, message board is displaying stop, but before the, uh, it also provides directive to the pilot as he's taxiing into position uh, using the, the guidance system will give them uh, distance to stop and that in mind with the in-ground lighting system uh, ensures that the pilot is moving into the proper position that was assigned to him or her. These, uh, the guidance system again uh, is an automated parking system. It will provide distance to go and ensure that the pilot is stopping uh, where he needs to to optimize the icing position from the truck's perspective. So as you can see here, the, uh, the signal provided to the aircraft is done at certain intervals and this will then be displayed on the message board for the pilot to realize uh, we use a Chevron count, so it'll be five, four, three, two, one, and slow and stop. The inset lighting, again, providing a visual for the pilot on the direction or the location that he has been uh, assigned, but also using inset lighting to delimit the vehicle safety zones gives the pilot that level of comfort that the vehicle safety, that the vehicles that are parked in the vehicle safety zones or at a distance that are adequate for him to taxi into uh, the the icing bay without any concern of hitting, uh, possibly hitting an air, uh, the, the truck. Uh, it also uh, ensures that during snow events that uh, paint markings usually have a tendency to disappear. Um, the lighting will show up uh, through uh, a level of, of snow and ensure that the pilot can see that and so do the operators. When we talk about this, uh, just briefly, uh, cost savings, uh, and this is something that is applicable to every airport. Uh, money, time is money, and with the advent of technology and reducing waiting time and verbal communication, uh, there's there's a savings in time that is uh, uh, to each uh, associated to each flight that is the ice on the CDF. And when you look at just a, a basic uh, number here, uh, over a 5,000 flight uh, service, if we take a three minute through efficiency, uh, less idle time, the savings according to the Airlines for America would equate to about a million dollars that each airline could save. And that is just being very conservative on, on skimming the top here. So the advantage of automation is to be able to process more flights per hour and reduce flight cancellations, uh, reduction uh, for uh, in needs for staff and equipment, and uh, improve safety. Um, as Tony mentioned, the environment uh, in a CDF is for the icing. There is no ground equipment around, so the operators gain more proficiency in positioning and in and out and going back into their vehicle safety zone. So. All of that translates to reduction in processing time and savings for the airlines. So before I pass it off to uh, O'Hare uh, that will talk about uh, their situation, I just want to run a quick video. It's just a, a summary of what I just talked about just to give everybody an overview. Uh, so if you will bear with me, it's about a two-minute video. And we'll run that. And I will hit play. There we go. So, what we're seeing here is uh, again an aircraft taxiing into a CDF, and although you can hear, there is very minimal communication between the flight deck and the dispatcher as everything is done through visuals. So, you can see Bay Management is assigning an aircraft to the bay. Uh, the pilot is taxiing in, is being advised to follow the greens, and so this is a view from the cockpit. What he 
what they're seeing as they're taxiing in. So you can see the message board displaying information to the pilot who's following the greens, going into a proper position. All the the icing vehicles, as you can see, are in the vehicle safety zones. It is delimited by the uh, in-ground lights, uh, which again gives pilot confidence he's coming into the right position, won't have any issues. The guidance system capturing the aircraft will bring it to a proper stop. And at that point, all stakeholders are getting the information. Brakes are set, aircraft is configured. Uh, there's no communication or waiting. As soon as all the operators will have that information, the pilot will confirm his treatment. Trucks can then start to move into position. So again, time is money, and the faster we get the information to all, um, uh, all stakeholders, the better the decisions are in the process and the more efficient we are. So, as you can see here, the pilot's configuration, uh, con configure aircraft in progress, the icing. So all of this information is stemmed from the one system that is providing the pilot information. As you can see, trucks are now moving into position. Uh, it is safe. They have a pattern they move into. There's no equipment around. There's less risk of uh, aircraft damage and more efficient. So you can see the icing is occurring. Once the icing is complete, you've got an overview. So you've got your stop bar that has been illuminated and that and the message boards displaying a stop uh, acts as a, uh, a permanent hold for the pilot until all trucks are safely back in their safety zone and prevent any incident from occurring. So, as you can see, the icing is finished now. The pilot will be given his uh, numbers through the, the pilot app. The holdover time will be produced for him, and once that's done, he'll be given directive to exit the, the icing bay uh, ready to taxi. then the process will continue for the next right. Right. Taxi Juliet, contact ground 125.9. There we go. Contact pad control. So there, there has been no, hardly any communication with the pilot and the de-icing coordinator or trucks. Everything is visual in real time, uh, which provides for a more efficient operation. And with that, I will now turn it over to, I believe it's Frank from CDA, who will speak to about the Chicago operations. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and it's an honor to be here with all of you to talk about our, our wonderful facility that we opened at the end of 2018. As you all know, it's, uh, it gets cold and snowy in O'Hare in Chicago in the Midwest, and uh, we are always ready to keep the operations at O'Hare uh, and Midway also running as smoothly and possibly as we can in winter conditions. As we all know, IC runways and taxiways are, are, are logistical challenges. And uh, since we opened the CDF, uh, our supporters uh, support our airline partners by providing them a dedicated space to the ICE aircraft and from the terminal gates. Uh, of course, this improves access to the gates and increases operational efficiency during, during cold weather months. As you see here, uh, the CDF was built to streamline operations and maintain safety uh, for passengers and our employees, and of course, reduce uh, winter delays at uh, one of the nation's busiest airports. If you're looking at the, the map that we have, you see where it's placed and where we built it. You see the core, uh, and we have um, we placed it on the west side of the airport uh, between the north airfield and the south airfield. As, uh, as most of you know, on the North Airfield, we have uh, uh, three east-west runways, the nines, and, uh, and uh, cross, which is uh, 22. And of course, to the south, uh, we have three runways to the south that are 10s and 22. And uh, uh, just to get back, we will have, at the end of 21, a uh, full uh, uh, a nine right, which is closed now. And uh, we're working in that area right now to connect the new 3,000 feet and the uh, and the rest of the runway. Next slide, please. There we go. Background on the CFD. Uh, we uh, started conceptual uh, uh, design and planning on this in 2013. 
Uh, and we started construction in April of 2017. So what we took advantage of is an area to the west, and uh, we, we looked at the area and we wanted a place that exactly where it would help uh, our partners. So a quick background, we started in 13 and, and uh, construction started in 17. Uh, there were three major packages. Uh, we didn't want to put it all under one package. It would be a very uh, difficult to procure it that way. So what we did is we did first earthwork. They came in and uh, did the earthwork. Took them about 12 months to do that. Came back uh, with the second package was with paving and utilities. Completed that, uh, and then of course the ramp tower, which we built, and then the airlines came in and put their uh, their systems in uh, with frequencies and so forth, and of course the technology. Uh, the project uh, for all four of those spaces. Phases were about $168 million, but we opened it in at the end of 2018. But the tower, even though it was completed on the day we opened it, uh, the airline still did not uh, have their systems in to, to, to operate it the way we wanted them to, of course. Uh, we, uh, we did do some icing on it uh, during that first winter, but then uh, as the winter ended in 2019, the airlines uh, uh, filled up their, um, or they uh, went in the tower, put their systems in. They had a couple of months to, to train and to get their systems working. And in 2019, the snow season, it was ready to go. Just to give you a couple of facts on it, uh, crews laid more than 3.5 million square feet of concrete for the CFD and the new taxi rates that connect uh, the rest of the airfield. The design and uh, construction phases of the project cr created an estimate of 800 jobs, okay, and, uh, and all CDA projects, this was no local taxpayer money. If you look at the facility, and if you look at, at, at the facility, it's almost 900,000 square feet, about 17 uh, football fields uh, uh, wide and long. Uh, there's, there's a single pad, and, uh, and uh, the way it works, Hopefully, my partners uh, uh, from City Operations and United Airlines are on. I know they've, uh, they're getting their snow program ready. But uh, what I'm going to do now, and we could have 20 narrow-body aircraft or five uh, wide-body aircraft at one time. Uh, each wide-body slot accommodates four narrow-body airplanes. So that's the pad itself. Uh, I'm going to turn it, turn it over to... Uh, Matt McLean, who is the project uh, manager for the Ramp Tower. How's it going, everybody? Um, just some quick facts on the Ramp Tower. Like Frank said, 2018 was a big year for us. Um, we wanted to get this pad up and operational. Um, but that actually, as we progressed with the technology on the pad, we had to get the design ready for the tower as well. Um, so when we were progressing everything through the design process and through construction, um, so if you're familiar with uh, city procurement and how tough that could be, uh, we only had 227 days to actually build the tower. Uh, so instead of being stuck in um, the first winter months, we got a uh, site prep package together for the foundations. Uh, the foundations are steel piles with concrete foundation um, perimeter walls. Um, the tower itself is about $9 million total construction between the site prep and the building. Uh, it's four floors. Uh, prefabricated insulated wall panels. Um, this gave us the ability to get the wall, to get the building up quick. Um, insulated it, did all the interior finishes. Um, the first three floors consist of break rooms, offices, uh, three IT closets, which were really critical to uh, making sure we were very flexible in our operation. Uh, the hardest thing about where we selected the site was that we did not have much IT infrastructure out on the west side of the airport. But so getting uh, the fiber optic lines out to there, getting them into the building, getting Americans' um, IT systems, United's IT systems, and the city's IT systems all into the building were pretty critical in making sure we were able to use the pad in the first year. Uh, so inside the cab, which is the most important part, there's eight interchangeable positions. So like I said, we can operate any one of the positions with either the United network, Americans network, or our own um, City network. Uh, some of the technology that's out on the pad that's connected to the tower, all the, as you saw before, all the variable message boards, all the in slab lighting, 
is all controlled from the cab and can all be interchanged whenever we need to um, for wide body or narrow body operations. Uh, and I'll kick it over to Keith if he's not covered in snow yet. Keith, are you on? Uh, I am here, guys. Again, good awesome. afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, thank you. My name is Keith Wisniewski. I'm the general manager of Airfield Operations. Um, my point is uh, part 139 of the airfield compliance for FAA and all of our snow removal program. Right now, if you look at a radar, Chicago is just starting to get inundated with snow. We're looking at about two to three inches over the next eight hours. So we are an active event. So I got a few minutes before I got all my teams moving out in the field, but I got our staff working on that. Um, this graphic that is up right now, I'd like to start out with discussing when developing your CDF and once you get to that stage of your development of it and you got your air traffic control involved. The big thing is for us, you start out with the letter of agreement of how the CDF is going to be used. Um, you look at our graphic that's up right now. In the summertime, only the fit pad footprint itself, the pad itself, is a non-movement area. All those other crossing taxi ways are active taxiways to the FAA tower at O'Hare in the summer months. In the winter months, all those areas that are north-south and east-west within the pad, those become non-movement areas through our letter of agreement. That gives the um, ice control guys in the CDF tower to control their aircraft, where ATC will get the aircraft down a pre route to it with a turnover point at a taxiway taxiway intersection, and then they would go to cr contact the CDF tower for guidance into the system. But the JCAI system does help alleviate a lot of that um, now that it's up and running, that they will get to the point and the lights turn on automatically to the aircraft to their base. Um, so the letter of agreement is a big point for myself and FAA Part 139 compliance, including that our airport certification manual. Um, also, things to think about for your snow belt airport, how heavy the snows are. Your teams, you got your priority one snow removal equipment for an airport, and you focus that on runways and to and from the gates. Your CDF now needs to become a priority one operation for your snow equipment removal process because that'll be a key situation to get your snow removal to and from the CDF. If that's not removed, you're not getting the planes in and out as efficiently as you need to. So it might have a factor on your particular airport and how much snow equipment you have available to maintain that. Um, we also dedicate a small team with our contractors, we have private contractors under the direction of um, CEA, Chicago Power Aviation, to push and pile the, all the snow in that big footprint that Mr. Grimaldi said, that 900,000 square feet. If you see to the left side of the image, in the middle, the asphalt area and the yellow trucks, that's our melting location. We'll push all the snow from that footprint into that area and melt it into our drains. Um, so that becomes really efficient, so you're not hauling snow and everything else to th consider that when you think about a central de-icing facility of where you're going to put all the snow and how you're going to get rid of it during the events. Um, we also have a contingent of a small broom team that will take care of those taxiways slash taxi lanes around the CDF to keep that viable. And they have, we've also found this season they can help out on the routes to and from the terminals at times to keep us uh, more efficient in supporting the CDF operation from the terminals. Um, it's been very good for us. Uh, traffic has been increased because, again, getting the planes off the gates, getting more planes into the gates. Non-COVID-19 restrictions, uh, we would be at a higher volume, and this is very, very, very helpful to keep that operation moving. But it does put a lot of pressure back onto your snow removal teams, all the overall airport, to keep those available because the airlines or carriers want to generate more flights in and out, and we need, as the airport operator, more runways and taxiways cleared for them to get to and land to. So again, a little pushback by there, but the stronger challenge for me and our teams to work at, which we're doing right now. Um, I will leave it there. If there's any questions, please have the organization get to me, but I do need to jump into our other operations over the next eight hours and uh, make sure we can do as many operations today as we do every day. Um, again, thank you for having me, and I don't know who's next. I apologize. Is, uh, I think uh, we, we have United and American. Hopefully they're on. I think Chris Pearson, Chris from uh, United, are you on? I'm not sure if Chris is on. Uh, this is Gene Dean, Eric. With, yes. Hey, Gene. So you're going to have to take the front to both of you guys, okay? <laughs> That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> no worries. So, uh, just uh, introducing Gene, Gene Harris from American Airlines. Gene, it's all yours. 
Yeah, Gene Herrick, American Airlines. I am the de-icing manager here at Chicago O'Hare. I happen to be currently at the CDF on the third floor, not in the cab. Uh, as Keith mentioned, we are inundated. Now we're getting uh, pretty heavy snow out at the CDF, so I'll try and uh, give a quick synopsis of how we fell into this and how this uh, we've worked together with the other airlines and uh, the city of Chicago and, and all the other groups that helped us out uh, back in about 2017. I got involved, uh, 2016, 2017. We started meeting with all kinds of uh, uh, people that would be involved in this directly, whether it was the FAA or the CDA, snow removal with Keith, um, with all, all of the uh, – other airlines that, that were involved, it was American and United that kind of stepped up and said, listen, we'll run this thing together and we'll, we'll do the best we can to, to uh, do it fair and equitable. And it seems like uh, now we're looking three years back from the first aircraft that was de-iced out here at the CDF, and that has uh, come to fruition with the uh, most technologically advanced CDF in the world, uh, I can I can hang my hat on that. Uh, we have a great camera system that even in the conditions we're in right at the current moment, uh, we can clearly see our, our trucks and the aircraft uh, moving in and out of the bays. Uh, as far as cooperation, we meet monthly and uh, have a WebEx call, you know, in COVID times now to talk about any issues or problems and uh you know, I just think back to 2018 when we were de-icing our first planes in, in January and February, and it's been, you know, just quite the change, quite the uh, quite the journey and quite the adventure, and I just give the advice to everyone out there, work together with your airline partners and your city and get advice from those that have uh, uh, pioneered this path. I mean, I reached out to a lot of people that I knew with SAE and uh, just pick their brains and ask questions and and we were able to cobble together a, a training program and some of it uh, wasn't quite right for once you get into the real world operations but you know you need to stay compliant to all the SAE FAA and uh, all the other guidelines and best practices. Thank you, uh, Gene. I'm going to see if Chris is on from United, Chris. Uh, Chris is probably working. I'm looking out the window now, and it's snowing pretty good. So thank you, Gene. Thank you, Matt. Uh, one thing I do want to say on uh, what Gene talked about, the relationship and the cooperation between the airlines, especially United and American, since we opened it, has been outstanding. I mean, it really has. Uh, I was out there the last snowstorm, and just the way the planes were coming in, Sometimes they direct it, uh, United, sometimes American does, but it's just amazing how they're working together, and it's really a team effort. So, uh, Tony, we're completed. I'm going to turn it over to our friends in Memphis. Gentlemen? Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Brian Tenkoff with the uh, Memphis Shelby County Airport Authority um, in the Development Department, Manager of Engineering and Construction. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Uh, I'm going to go over a few slides. I know we're getting towards the end of this to, to talk on um, our current uh, CDF project that's underway under construction. Uh, hit on a, a few of the background items with the project, some project elements, um, and uh, connect some of the dots for some of the previous discussions. So um, uh, on the slide here, I, I've got an uh, aerial of our airport, for those of you all not familiar, and I do have this rotated 90 degrees, so um, left is north, right is south. Uh, we have three parallel uh, north-south runways, uh, one uh, crosswind, east-west east crosswind. Um, what you see in yellow kind of in the middle, that's our terminal, so our passenger operations are all in that area. And then to the left of the screen or the north of our airfield is our FedEx Express World Hub. So all of our cargo operations, essentially all north of, of runway 927, our crosswind. Um, so in this exhibit, I'm, I'm showing you our current de-ice operations. Uh, so the blocks you see in purple are where the cargo um, operations de-ice. 
Um, what you see in yellow is the passenger operation. So you can see we're kind of all over the airfield. Um, a lot of at-gate uh, de-icing. Uh, we utilize some taxiways, um, hold pads, um, and then the passengers are typically all at-gate de-icing. Um, and when we get um, bigger events, we do have a couple spots just south of there that you can see on taxiway. Um, the, the red block, um, that is our current um, de-ice location, uh, new CDF location for reference. Um, and, and I guess real quick to hit on our existing, existing um, operations real quick. So w with us being spread out, we don't have any um, centralized collection system. Everything is collected through uh, sluice gates. We have some diversion systems set up, uh, glycol recovery vehicles. So essentially we collect what we can through those systems. They end up in a frack tank. And then we have a couple points on the airfield where that fluid ends up getting put into the sanitary system and ultimately treated at the city uh, wastewater treatment plant. Um, so uh, one of the big drivers of this project because of that is, is our MPDS permit and working through our state agency, which is TDEC, um, that handles that um, as far as meeting uh, certain limitations, um, percent of collection. So this project initially was um, to, uh, to meet those, those requirements that we're working through and, and um, with a new NPDS permit. Um, so again, back with, the, with the, uh, the red block that I show on there, that is our footprint of our new CDF um, de-icing pad. Um, you, you can see we didn't have a lot of real estate for it um, where this location worked out good. Um, at least in Memphis, most of our winter weather is coming from the north, so we're in a north flow. Um, so we were able to position it also in a good location. So we are having those short holdover times. They're going straight from pad to threshold and, and, and departures. Uh, kind of a project scope layout of the, uh, of the CDF project. I'll hit on some of these just real quick. So we have 12 de-icing positions. 11 of them are group five. Um, the 777 aircraft is the design aircraft on this. Um, the, the, the 12th pad is a group six, but it's a, it's a composition pad or combination pad. So we can either service a group six aircraft, 7478, or we can actually get to uh, group three aircrafts. Um, so what you're seeing, the blue is the de-icing pads. Um, what's in green, we also had to construct some crossover taxiways. Um, yellow, we had some taxiway bridges tied to it. We had to relocate um, our, uh, a road that runs down midfield of our airfield that connects um, to our public street and some operations. Um, we have operation support facility, maintenance facility in the middle, uh, tank farm, distribution system, underground, um, stormwater tank, and I'll hit on a couple of those here in just a minute. Uh, system diagram, so kind of the basis of the overall design to, uh, to hit on a couple of those. So um, distribution system, the glycol distribution system, um, if you're looking at the top, the red and green and blue, we have uh, type one, type four and a water supply um, that go through pump house out to the pads. Um, at each individual pad, we actually have blending stations for the type one um, glycol to uh, mix that uh, to the proper mixture based on the conditions that we're at. Um, so that's for every one of those go to every one of our vehicle safety zones. Collection system that we have, you kind of see the, the blue uh, squares around the pads. We have a trench drain system. Um, all of that water gets collected in the trench drain system, goes into a large underground detention tank, uh, 2.5 million, approximately 2.5 million gallons. Uh, from that point, the discharge is monitored uh, to de determine concentration of glycol. And depending on that, that um, threshold that's set, it will either be sent to um, just regular stormwater, or if it's above that threshold, it'll go into sanitary system through a series of, of, of a pump station force main, and then um, get treated at the city wastewater treatment plant. Couple big uh, components of the uh, project, airfield pavement wise, it's 3.2 million square feet of airfield pavement. Bulk of that is the de-ice pad um, with the balance being um, the those crossover taxiways. Uh, typical pavement section, because of our critical aircraft, we have a pretty stout uh, pavement section, about three feet. Um, the glycol stormwater collection system, uh, 7,300 feet of trench drain. I mentioned the big 2.5 million gallon um, underground detention system. We have the pump station, lift station, um, and then the monitoring station to determine where we can send the, uh, the glycol. Distribution system, we, we will have type one, um, type four glycol. We have a glycol and water supply system out to the uh, pads themselves. Uh, we have load stations at each of the vehicle safety zones. Um, I mentioned the blending cubes. 
um, to be able to have more efficient usage of that glycol to match exactly what the aircraft and or uh, weather and temperature require. Uh, centralized tank farm and pump house, um, and then a, a bunch of above and below ground piping for that distribution system. Uh, BSCs were mentioned earlier in the presentation, so uh, we we um, we actually have um, on the water end of the VSCs we have uh, the high mass lighting electronic message boards and those fill stations. Um, we we did go between um, a centralized filling station and actual localized in each at each VSC um, because of the nature of of the aircraft that get deiced here. Um, most of the most of them are wide body uh, that require six plus trucks at a time, and to maintain the amount of uh, deicing fluid that that is used on each aircraft, to keep from one running out, they have to refill every 15 minutes, regardless of, of the fluid level. So um, there's quite a few um, filling operations in in an event, um, which equates to approximately 144 refill operations over three three hour period with our cargo uh, departure. Um, we were trying to accommodate enough trucks in case the truck went down, so we've got p positions for seven trucks within those VSCs just in case one goes down and one's getting filled. Uh, we're not disrupting the de-icing operation. Um, we are also going to utilize a lot of the de ice pad technology um, through JCAI's um, AIM system. So we'll have the bay management software, electronic mass message boards, thermal cameras, and then in pavement IP addressable center line lights. Uh, operation maintenance facility, the ice pad tower. So uh, you kind of see a, a conceptual laid out the bottom and then a, and then a uh, rendering of that facility. So it's going to house operation muster areas. Um, we are going to have six, um, six bays for uh, maintenance on the ice trucks, break room, restroom, utility room, and then the, the actual cab and tower portion of the facility to run the, uh, run the pads. Uh, quick background on some of the users and, and, and what drove size and type. Um, cargo fleet FedEx is, is obviously the, the, the big user at our airfield, 137 annual operations, um, primarily wide body aircraft. So of, of their 385 aircraft, 266 of those are wide body. Um, 37 of those aircraft are the group, the group 5, 777 um, with, with a lot of operations and those are continuing to grow. Our passenger fleet, those operation numbers are pre-COVID, but you know, 50,000 annual operations um, with the, the primary, primary design aircraft for them being a group 3, 737, um, A319, 320-321. So the cargo fleet and um, the demand is what drove the design of this pad. Obviously, um, we do get some um, have potential to get Group 6 aircraft. We are a destination airport for the A380, um, and then there are some additional users that um, potentially could use 7478s at our at our um, airport flight schedule. Um, this was this was a big one. This is where we're kind of unique in, in some instances. Um, the, 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 we have a three-hour launch, essentially two times a day for the cargo operation, um, where they they get all of their aircraft out in that three-hour period. Um, during peak season, which obviously coincides with winter season as well, October to December, um, we get about 180 departures um, in a three-hour period overnight as well. Um, we had a few operational considerations. Um, I mentioned a three-hour standard cargo launch break. We identified that we wanted to try to get that completed within five hours and try to minimize um, passenger operations off the gate delay no more than 60 minutes. Um, our consultants used a series of models um, that produced different weather events, bay occupancy times, to ultimately determine the number of pads, which we landed on um, 12 to try to meet those conditions. Um, essentially, in the light snow um, frosting situations, we have no reduction. We meet all those goals. When we start getting to heavy snow, ice, um, and freezing rain, it does turn into um, either longer, longer launch or, or some reduced capacity of the, uh, of the cargo uh, fleet. Just quick background, um, so that, that aerial you're seeing is about a month old, so mid-January, I think, is when it was taken, so we're making a lot of progress. Um, we, we had this project split within three phases, three construction phases. Phase one was um, bridges and roadway, so this got our connector um, taxiway bridges in, uh, service road bridge, and then relocated Lewis Carruthers, which is the road that comes up through the middle of our airfield. Phase two, which is currently ongoing, and, and back up. Phase one started 2018, uh, was completed just this past year. 
Phase two is the large portion, the, the site work drainage pads, um, marking lighting, um, the bulk of the project. That started May of 2020 um, and is anticipated to be completed August of 2022. And then phase three, which is the operation maintenance building, um, it's currently under design and we are anticipating completion of that project along with phase two to have everything ready for a 2022-2023 uh, winter DI season. So with that, Tony, I can turn it back to you. Thank you, Brian. Um, so with that, we're going to turn over to Q&A, and because we're over on time, we're going to make this very brief. Uh, we did receive, as I mentioned earlier, almost 200 questions. So we're going to take a look at those questions, respond to those, and get back to everybody uh, at a later date, we're going to work with ACC to get those questions and answers out to everybody. Uh, but we're going to take a look at two quick questions. Uh, first one, how do you accommodate other uses of the facility when not in winter operations? Um, so the icing facility has a lot of pavement and can be used uh, for more than just the icing. Uh, some of the airports that we've worked with in the past have used the, the ice pad for remain overnight operations for some of the airlines that cannot park at the terminal gates, as well as in some instances during um, periods of inclement weather, uh, the de-ice pad, if it is on part of the movement area, can also be used as a holding pad for aircraft that are in the ground stop. Um, also interesting to note, as the summer turns to fall, a lot of the airports and airlines need to start practicing their de-icing for the following winter, so they will turn to the de-ice pad and actually use it for practicing of uh, the de-icing of aircraft so they're ready to go for the following winter season. Um, question number two that we're going to answer today, who pays for these systems? And I'm going to turn that over to Nate Lennon. He's going to give a quick answer to that, although that can be a very complicated answer. Uh, thanks, Tony. Yeah, <clears throat> um, funding sources for CDFs can be a very complicated answer. Um, I, I am going to bring in a my partner from uh, Memphis, Brian Tankoff, to help on this one. But um, essentially, uh, there are elements of the CDF that are AIP eligible, um, airfield pavement uh, being one. Um, there are elements that are non-eligible, um, some of the proprietary technology, some of the facilities outside of the airfield, such as potentially, such as uh, control towers, glycol supply, storage systems, um, certain elements of it. Um, Brian, maybe you can expand on this a little bit. Yeah, I can speak on it briefly, and you, you kind of hit some of the high points. So um, in our project specifically, we are, we are seeking AIP reimbursement where we can. Um, essentially, glycol distribution, um, all the technology, um, our, our control facility in the middle, th those primary components are, are, are deemed non-AIP eligible. So our, our project, we actually had... Um, two bid schedules. Um, bid schedule one was eligible items. Bid schedule two was not eligible to be able to show those costs separately, track those costs separately to make sure we weren't mixing eligible and ineligible components. Um, the, the one caveat with the, dist the glycol distribution system is, is the pipe that's actually in pavement. The pavement is eligible. Um, the, the pipe, that, the glycol pipe that actually goes in pavement um, was also deemed eligible as part of that. So there is a little caveat to the glycol distribution system, but but, but in general, um, especially with our project, the, the glycol distribution, um, you know, technology, um, the blending cubes, the, 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 the message boards, all of that was on the non-eligible portion um, that is just getting funding um, lo locally with local, local um, funds and needs. All right, thank you, Brian and Nate, and thank you, everybody, today. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Micah for some closing remarks. Thank you, Tony. On behalf of ACC, I would like to extend a great big thank you to Kimley Horn, JCAII, Gresham Smith, and their partners for putting together today's program. Um, I do encourage you to check out some of our other webinar offerings for professional development on the Training Hub website. And again, just thank you everybody for participating in today's webinar.